delighted we get to continue this conversation and hopefully get to the next level of what it is to live in a uh, an understanding that perception is nothing more than the output of our minds and is malleable, changeable, and of course, if it's uh, based on hostility or fear, uh, they're to be forgiven. And we're working diligently to assist people in understanding that forgiveness has nothing whatsoever to do with letting other people off the hook for what's moving inside of you, that forgiveness is a word that represents a tool with which you go inside your own mind and remove the root of all hostility and fear. So delighted that you're here to be with us. Miss Jeannie, do we have anybody in the phone queue with a hand up or anything happening in the chat room? No, it is all quiet on this end. I was just double checking to see if I had gotten any emails that we haven't answered yet. But there are no questions on switchboard. No hands up. So if someone presses okay. one, you're first in line. All right. Well, you did forward to me a um, an email regarding Sean's question from last week. And the original question was, a thought converts into a molecule. So accurate when we think a thought, literally, that thought becomes what we call material right, that comes out of the higher vibratory realm and shows itself in what we call the world of matter, or what, what the senses tap into as matter. So it converts the thought into a molecule. It's what mode our spirit is in that determines if it is flushed out or absorbed, correct? And I had expressed that I wasn't sure what that meant. And so uh, there's a clarification. Let's see if we can make sense of it here. Concerning thoughts, whether cycled within our mind or coming from some outer space being, well, I'm not sure about how many thoughts we get from outer space beings. We all experience them. Then comes emotion. Yes, my take would be that when we think a thought, and that thought becomes literally a molecule, a neuropeptide. When that neuropeptide, because we are creative beings, we are have been given, or I suspect this would be why, we've been given a warning system that tells us when our creative process is on target or off base, and that is what we call emotions. So when I engage in a thought, that thought, when it, that neuropeptide, when it lands on a cell where there's a matching receptor site, gives a signal off called an emotion. And then he goes on to say, and we either react or see it for what it is. I'm not sure those things would be exclusive of each other. There's Kuba, Brahma, or plain anger that determines what type of reaction we have as it resonates into being. Well, we're kind of mixing uh, uh, apples and oranges here, would be my take, Sean. That Kuba and Rachma from the Aramaic are filters in the mind. That and you know, if you think about what a filter does, you know, if I have a, a a large window at one end of a room and that room gets overheated because of the infrared rays that come in from the sun when the sun hits the window, if I put a filter on the window, I filter out the infrared rays. I can still see outside, but I can filter out the infrared rays so the room doesn't get so hot. So that's what uh, Rachma and Kuva are. So Rachma is a filter over the frontal lobes of the brain where intentions are stored. And what that filter does, what Rachma does when it's active, and only one filter can be active at a time over each part of the brain, 
There are three available filters over the frontal parts of the brain. One would be hostility, one would be fear, and the other would be rachma. So rachma, in the same way that if I put a, uh, a dark um, filter over the window, filters out the infrared light, rachma filters out negative and destructive intentions. So inhibits the passing of destructive or negative intentions. Kuba has a similar filter over perception, a la the Aramaic understanding. So we have, again, three filters, hostility, fear, or Kuba over perception. When Kuba is active, it inhibits destructive or negative intentions. I mean, when Kuba is active over perception, it inhibits irritating content from being, from passing into awareness, allows only to pass content that is based in love, and or it inhibits threatening content. So that would be the action of Rachma and Kuba in the Aramaic. So I'm not sure how you're relating that or plain anger that determines what kind of reaction we have as it resonates into being. My take would be that if anger is resonated by a thought, it's because that thought is moving some form of pain content or resonating some form of pain content. And anger is the drug. Anger is the anesthetic that people use in order to anesthetize against feeling pain content. I'm not just sure how you're you're relating those to um, to Rachman, Kuba, and then does canceling the goals allow love to activate? Or is it only by the instructions found in the Lord's Prayer that activates Kuba and Rachma? My offering would be that Kuba and Rachma would be activated in part by breathing and by just taking charge. You know, if uh, let's say that the windows close or uh, open, and that's how the uh, the infrared rays are getting in the room. If I push the window closed then, and the glass is covered with that filter, then the infrared rays are inhibited. So, Rachman and Kuva are activated by choice, by an act of will. Uh, Then, so, canceling goals, you know, when you look at the Harvard research, it says that in a time frame where 10,000 brain cells are firing. The max amount of data that goes into conscious awareness is nine bits of information. Obviously, something filters or something determines which nine bits of information my mind is going to use in order to build my mind's construct, my perception. And obviously, and to me, this is probably one of the most genius pieces of information to come to Earth. Obviously, if I know what it is that drives that process, change whatever that is, then the process itself is going to change. So once I recognize there's a perception moving in my mind that's based in some form of hostility or fear, I know that I've lost the setting of Rachma and Kuba and that the goal that I've set has recruited data based in some form of hostility or fear and that's what results in my pained perception. So the idea and the reason for canceling a goal is that by canceling the driver, the goal that drives my pained perception that construct in my mind collapses. And when it collapses, 
You know, if you think about the 9-11 towers when they went down, what did they do? They collapsed into their own foot. When you recognize that when someone, when I say to somebody, well, why did you do that? Or why are you feeling that way? And they say, I don't know. What they're saying is, well, there's something going on in my unconscious, and that's why it's happening. I'm not in touch with because this information is unconscious. I'm not aware of what it's about. And so when I cancel the goal, perception collapses, collapses in on its own footprint, which is the unconscious part of the mind. So now if I'm really paying attention, if I'm breathing, if I'm listening within, I'm going to have access to that hidden part of my own mind. And at that point, if I determine that, you know, well, gee, this thing that produces pain content in me isn't an energy that I choose to have within me, then I'm going to choose to change that thought. And or whenever that unconscious content is available directly. You know, unconscious content comes available indirectly when we live in denial and dissociate from that content and project it into our brain's image of someone else. So when someone's in a place of pain and in the, in the blame game, this is somebody else's fault, they're obviously in touch with, in relationship with that pain content, but they don't believe it's theirs because their brain is showing them a false picture, a false perception that it's about somebody else. So they're in relationship with it, but it's an indirect relationship, which means they're in a relationship with whatever that energy is, but they can't change it because they're not in direct contact with it. By canceling a goal and collapsing perception, that unconscious content now can be accessed directly. I go, oh, I'm not feeling this rage or fear or sadness or grief or whatever it is because of what Bill did. I'm feeling it because it's in me. And now that I'm in touch with it, I'm in, I'm, I have access to the root of that unconscious content directly, I can change whatever's behind it. And so that would be the whole objective of canceling the goal. I hope that uh, makes sense. And if there are parts of it that still aren't connecting in, you know, if you happen to be on, Sean, let's, uh, how about pushing one, let's talk about it. And or uh, you'll have this content and, uh, and maybe there'll be another email with, with more clarification or question or content to move forward with. So, Ms. Jeannie, is Sean with us by any chance? He is not. But one of the things that I thought of when you reread that, um, and he was asking about Brock Makuba or um, anger, or, is the filters over the mind of, you know, whether it's Brock Makuba, it's either loving or fearful or hostile. So I don't know if that right. may be where he, he picked up the... Um, anger part of it, that, that's one of the filters. And if the... Sure, the hostility filters. Active, yeah. Yeah, that may be what he was referring to. And so in the notes for today, I have put two links, one to a page that's on the website explaining Rockman Cuba, and then a second one is the schematic of the mind, the poster of the um, filters over the mind. Oh, I'm not even sure now. Probably... Revision after revision probably took eight years to develop. So, yeah, have a look at that poster. It's uh, it's powerful when you start looking at that, when you see how the mind operates. It's it's like a schematic, and you go, oh, you know, I mean, if somebody's uh, working on a piece of electronic equipment and they have no schematic, no schematic, it's like, well, where? How do we go? What do we? How do we fix this thing? You got a schematic, you know exactly what's supposed to be happening and or exactly what is happening, and therefore... It becomes much more repairable. Cool. Well, I will then assume that we're as complete as we can be with that question. And do we have anybody in the phone queue with a hand up or anybody in the chat room with another thought for us? It is all quiet. Awesome. Well, then let's head on with our uh, earlier 
uh, piece of work that we've been working with now for some time. And my page just jumped, so I'm going to have to open it again. Give me one moment. Excuse me for taking a moment here to get to Pardon my hold up here. My my phone is being a little bit funky. And slow. Let's go ahead here. If you just came on, we are here. <laughs> Didn't want you to think that the sound yeah, is having a little bit, working. Uh, a challenge here. Okay, so what we were talking about, and uh, this is a conversation that started about two weeks ago, which we just had uh, questions and processing in between, but we were talking about uh, this whole idea of being responsible for the energies that are moving within ourselves. And if we're stuck in the why is this happening to me again question and believing that the why is this happening to me again is because of someone else, then we're locked into this self-imposed pain um, because we're, we're holding this belief that somebody else is the problem in our lives. And of course, if you're feeling something, obviously you can only feel it if it's within you. And if it's within you, the reason you're feeling it is because it's within you, not because of someone else. So the objective here is to recognize if I'm in a why is this happening to me again experience, that if I've got the tools, I can change the content of my mind and escape from or change the dynamics that uh, I say I'd like to be finished with. Otherwise, the mind can take any denied or dissociated content literally use that information to build our brain's image of someone else, which means then they show up in our minds with our problem attached. And of course, we swear it must be their problem. So let's look at a different perspective than one who's been taught by a family system or a culture um, taught by people who are devoted members of the one world universal religion of blame. You know, when we feel pain without being touched, you know, sure as somebody punching you in the nose, nobody can hurt you. But how often do we feel, how, or pardon me, how often do we hear somebody say, oh, that really upset me. What they said really hurt me. I mean, think about that for a minute. Somebody says something, you haven't been touched, and you go into hurt. Why do you go into hurt? I mean, let's say somebody, you know, with a typical conversation. Oh, yeah, I was talking to Bill the other day on the phone, and what he said really hurt me. So, so let's analyze that for a minute. Bill is on the other side of the country, and he has this little glass and plastic device with uh, electrons and protons and neutrons flowing through it and transistors and a little plastic uh, cone called a speaker and a another plastic cone called a microphone. And Bill uh, causes his voice box to move, which causes air molecules to move, which causes this plastic cone called a microphone to move. And the microphone converts that 
those movement of air molecules into a an electrical signal that then is broadcast from his phone to a tower maybe two miles down the road in uh, Temecula, California, and it goes from that tower to the tower in in Seattle and goes to the tower to the tower, and it, and it goes through about 15 different towers, and finally, here you are in Bristol, Virginia, and there's a tower down the road, and that signal carrying the electrical impulse that was created by Bill's voice vibrating a little plastic cone now is picked up by your phone 3,000 miles away. And when it's picked up by your phone, your phone decodes that signal and causes a little plastic cone called a speaker to vibrate. That causes air molecules to move. Those air molecules hit a drum in your ear that causes your ear to, to drum to vibrate. And that vibrating causes some little hairs to move and those little hairs create an electrical signal, and your brain tells you what it has resonating in it, and you say, Bill, upset me. I mean, think about what just happened there for somebody to be, say, as ridiculous a thing as what Bill said really upset me. So all of that, is the cause of my upset? I mean, hey, how silly can we get? So again, if I feel pain without being touched, that pain I would offer is often a generational experience that's up for healing. There's content in me, if I'm in pain, that my brain interprets as pain, and pain is an interpretation of the brain. And as you apply forgiveness, you literally free yourself from the capacity to generate any kind of internal pain. And when you do that, you'll be opening the space to free your generations. And ultimately, energetically, when enough people step into the place of responsibility and in taking responsibility, instead of speaking, thinking, and perceiving from the one world, universal mind, religious mind of blame, one moves into responsibility and starts to shift the errant belief that somebody else is the cause of this pain, we open the space ultimately for literally the entire world to learn forgiveness, to be freed energetically as that understanding builds and we stop this game of, of the universal. I mean, so many people are by the age of four are card-carrying very devout religious members of this one world universal religion. And each person who frees themselves from that and steps into responsibility and says, yeah, it's pretty silly to think that a little plastic cone carrying a signal that came all the way from the other side of the country, that vibrating in the room, moving air molecules is the cause of my pain. I mean, how silly can you get? Yeah, if Bill came over the baseball bat, canceled the thought and hit me in the head, yep, yep, that, the Bill here is causing some pain in me. Although there's another level of what is it in me that draws Bill with the baseball bat? That's a different story. But the little cone in the speaker and the air molecules moving, that, that hurt me? When we take responsibility and go to that level of healing, we come out the other side and freed of internalized, generational pain, one reaches a new level of serenity, a new level of aliveness, having taken the load off of their tissue structure. And because this experience of blame, blame is so universal, and people do not realize that they've given up the aliveness they're designed for, when you have that opening, you will perhaps be in an experience that is, you know, just beyond the understanding of the world. Somebody talked about, you know, the serenity that passes all understanding. In Aramaic, when 
when they talked about Yeshua giving, leaving the world his peace, that's not what it says in Aramaic. The word was, I leave my serenity. So if you've been brought up in the one world religion of blame, and you haven't broken through that yet, then you have not yet experienced the level of serenity that you will experience when you live a truly human life, when the true active presence of love is moving in you with no oppositional energy, no resistance whatsoever. So recognizing how the mind works, and this is where that schematic comes in that Jeannie said she put in the notes, the mechanism underlying the process of generating perception is literally one where neuropeptides uh, circulate and find cells with which they have affinity. They attach to the cell's receptor site. Landing on those cells, they literally insert themselves. And if you were inside of the cell watching that process happening, you would say that what just came into the cell was chemistry. These neuropeptides, these information carriers, are designed to inform that cell about what's going on in the world, the actual world. But when we substitute perception, perceptual constructs, and put that on the cell, then the cell, not knowing what's going on in the actual world, is not going to know how to function properly. These neuropeptides are designed to actually communicate to the cell what's actually going on either internally within structure or externally within the world. And sadly, this process has for the most part been hijacked and compromised by errant perception. Much of this cellular communication process has become a rehash of unresolved associated traumas from the past, often arising from patterns carried from generation to generation in the genes. You know, in the ancient Aramaic, when they said the sins of the fathers will be passed, yea, unto three and four generations, that wasn't some kind of theological threat. They were just telling us how physiology works. So reflections of these unconscious processes appear to the cell. When, when, when the cell is being informed by errant generational perception, the cell is being informed incorrectly. Although they appear to be present moment actualities, they're nothing but echoes of the past. Now, understanding that unresolved generational issues are passed along in one's lineage, I suspect, is what led Henry David Thoreau to write. You know, here's a guy in the 1850s, and I suspect that he's, he's coming out of a level of understanding from his own personal process and his experience of others, and he says, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. Now he's talking here, my, my offering would be, he's talking about men, women, human beings who live as card-carrying members of the one world religion of blame. They live in denial. In other words, when they're in pain, their thinking goes, somebody else caused my pain. Therefore, they dissociate from the true content of their own minds and they live in projection. So here's how he describes someone who's a member of the one world universal religion of blame. The mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. What is called resignation is confirmed desperation. From the desperate city, they go into the desperate country and have to console themselves with the bravery of minks and muskrats. In other words, in order to feel some power, people who live in this one world universal religion of blame have to go kill something. 
A stereotype but unconscious despair is concealed even under what are called the games and amusements of mankind. You know, you look at most so-called comedy and what's it based in? It's based in pain and trauma-based experiences. And then he says, and here... He's shifting now into what human life would do. So he finishes that statement up about desperation. He says, but it is a characteristic of wisdom to do desperate things. In other words, to live in a world where one has been alleviated of generational traumas and in that last line, he's, he's giving a clue to at least his comprehension, my take, my interpretation, my best understanding of that piece of writing. He's, he's giving us a clue to his comprehension of what it is to experience yourself as love, as a human being, actually directly free of unresolved perceptual defects and in the, in the, the language of the culture, that state is still pretty much indescribable. We really don't have many words for it for the mass of people to experience that because it's not yet in common experience. If you can sit quietly, you know, in the midst of the turmoil of your own cognitive mind. So somebody, you know, a signal comes in through your phone that resonates some brain cells that can contain some pain, and you recognize, oh, this pain is mine, then you have a gateway or you have a doorway open with which to become acquainted with and free yourself of your pain. Now, if you can sit quietly when that pain is moving, when the turmoil is moving in your cognitive mind, if there is any within you, and at that same moment, you can feel the underlying current of love and serenity below the surface of the mind and its disturbances, you're approaching the possible human life. You're moving in the direction of what human life is really designed for. If not, your untoward projections will ultimately destroy you unless unless they're removed. You know, if you go to the ancient Aramaic, where it, 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 well, it's tied together with both the, the world of physics today and the ancient Aramaic. You know, Einstein says, on such things as matter, we've been all wrong. What we have heretofore called matter is energy. Energy whose vibrations have been so lowered as to be perceptible to the senses. Einstein says, there is no matter. Matter doesn't exist. You are an energetic being. If there is an energy moving within you that is based in some form of hostility or fear, and you choose to use the tools to remove it, then you'll free yourself of it. As you do that, you'll tend to move into that state that I just described. That yes, you're not finished with your work, None of us are. You know, I'm, I'm speaking from my own experience here. But even when the turmoil starts to move, if I can take a breath, get quiet, and recognize that there's still this undercurrent of love that is my human life, then I'm moving in the direction of what's possible for us as human beings. And then remember that, remember that forgiveness is the word that describes the removal of what doesn't belong. Thoughts based in love produce neuropeptides that communicate information that support its target cells' aliveness and well-being with integrative, supportive, quote-unquote, chemistry, which is really information. When the neuropeptide lands on a cell, again, if you were inside the cell, it would look like chemistry coming into the cell. But that chemistry is just information. It literally is mind energy. And in our misperception, thinking we live in a physical world, we call that particular frequency range chemistry. 
but it is really information. Space and love produce information that supports the cell's well-being and aliveness and thoughts based in hate, anger, fear, loss, when they insert themselves in the cell, show up as, quote, again, quote, unquote, chemistry information. That And that information will destroy the cell. Now, go back to the ancient Aramaic idea that says the wages of sin is death, and you recognize that sin is an archery term that means off the mark. If I put an energy that's off the mark into my cell, then I've put in a disintegrative quality of energy, and that energy is going to destroy the cell. Now, my offering is that is the root of all disease, pain, and suffering. And people say, well, no, Michael, you don't understand. There are these things called bacteria and viruses. Well, excuse me, but a healthy cell cannot be attacked by the bacteria or the virus. The germ theory, and, and remember, it's, it's, it's never been called the germ fact. It's still called the germ theory because it's never been proven, and it never will be proven. But that germ theory of disease is an antiquated misunderstanding of cellular function. Every thought, each piece of chemical information, when stored in the cell, either supports the life of the cell or the destruction of the cell. What quality is it? Is it integrative, building up the cell, or is it disintegrative, an Aramaic sin, tearing down the cell? If we're in pain or turmoil, remember the neuropeptide hits the cell, we're being warned that we have a thought disorder. We're being warned that there's a disintegrative quality of energy. And in a very typical sense, this is the beneficial understanding of what the word sin means. It was originally meant to be beneficial. Oh, if pain is showing up, I'm being told that there's something I'm putting into my structure that doesn't belong here. So when we engage in thoughts that create the quote-unquote chemistry of destruction, pain's the warning signal that those thoughts don't belong in our structure. And thoughts compressed into neuropeptides, when they land on a cell, create a sensation in the cell. That's what we call emotions. And these emotions are simply there to inform the cell and us of the quality of our thoughts, constructive or destructive. Our emotions are this, the cell's way of showing us what it is that we're doing to the cell. And we're being shown at the earliest stage possible. It's like, you know, if, if you listen at the first moment that there's some form of trauma going on in your cellular structure and you choose to become aware of the energy you're engaging in, that's going to be the easiest place to process that out. If you wait until the tissue starts to decay, it becomes red and festering and, and uh, uh, filled with inflammation, processes advance significantly at that point. It's going to take time to turn back that energetic assault and remove or forgive the content that's been put into the cell that's creating that sort of assault. And then, of course, sadly, because of the way the world works today, the the way most of us have been raised, most everybody blames somebody else for the warning signals that are assaulting their own cellular structure, and they subvert the purpose of their own self-created pain. So this is the case where, you know, there's an old saying that says, ignorance is bliss. No, ignoring the feedback of your structure is anything but bliss. Ignorance, in this case, is self-destruction. So most people, when experiencing pain, deny responsibility and, and whatever. And the pain could be something as simple as, as simple as just this little niggle or upset. Oh, you know, just talking to you and I feel bad. Look what you do to me. 
No. If you're talking about, if, if you come away from a disturbed state of mind talking about someone else, then you're in denial. You're playing the blame game. And when you do that, you're doing that to yourself and hiding the part of your own mind with which you're doing that. So this whole process of denial, dissociation, and projection means that we're literally creating a natural condition in our own minds called unconsciousness. We dissociate from and hide the internal dynamic of destruction that's self-inflicted. And then most people blame somebody else. You know, you listen to some of the biggest voices in the news today. Some of the supposed toughest, hardest, smartest people are the most professional victims. Talk about how everybody else is making a victim of them. It's like, wake it up, folks. If you're as tough and as smart and, you know, have as good a brain as you say you have, why are you always talking about how everybody else is the reason you're in pain or you're in trauma? Why are you such a victim? And many find a way to self-medicate, to, to drug themselves, to cover up the disintegrative energies that they're engaging in, and they, they self-medicate to hide the resultant pain from themselves. The number one drug of the culture I would offer is busyness. That's the thing that people, you know, if, over the years, I look back over the last 50 years of teaching forgiveness, and, you know, I do a workshop on why is this happening to me again, and people are excited and they love the ideas. It's like, wow, I can clean all this disintegrative energy. Man, I'm ready to go for it. That's so awesome, Michael. Hooray. And then by the end of the week, after I've suggested they do five worksheets a day, uh, for the week that we're there, I actually usually suggest that people do five worksheets a day once they're introduced to forgiveness for 40 days. But along about Wednesday, when I say to people who on Sunday afternoon were really excited about the forgiveness process and said, yes, I'm going to do those worksheets, along about Wednesday, and I say, how many have done your five worksheets a day? If there are 100 people in my audience... I'll be really delighted if two of them have done the five worksheets a day. And when I say, well, gee, you know, everybody said, yay, this is so great, I'm going to do that. You know what the answer is when I ask them why they didn't get it done? I was too busy. Busyness is number one. And everything from junk food to prescription drugs, to busyness. Oh, the number two drug in the culture? And most people think of this as an emotion. Anger or hostility is not an emotion. Anger is an anesthetic. Anger is a way to anesthetize against self-inflicted nonsense, S-I-N. And people can use anything in order to anesthetize and destroy their awareness, in order to remain unconscious of their own thoughts and what they're doing to themselves. And the accompaniment of that unconsciousness is always the holding of the breath. I would offer that pain is designed to shake us back to awareness. Its purpose, and you know, kind of tongue-in-cheek, I like to say in my workshops, its purpose is to make our ears grow so that we listen to our own internal feedback systems, which are trying to inform us when we're off the mark. And I would offer that these principles describe the only cause of disease in the human body. Bacteria and viruses do not cause diseases. Again, remember, it's only the germ theory. The organisms that we blame, the bacteria and the virus, are what are called in naturopathic medicine reducer organisms. When a cell is assaulted and is beginning to decay, 
there's a food supply. If you feed them, they will come. When the cell begins to decay, that gives rise to an organism that consumes the decaying cell. And what the people who originated the germ theory, the error that they made, is they assume that, oh, we see a diseased cell, and oh, look at this, this, this organism. This must be the cause. No, actually, the reduced organism is just trying to clean up the mess, the dead and the decaying material that is dying as a result of being assaulted by the mind energy of hostility or fear. So these reducer organisms are simply designed to have an affinity for dying cells, and they assist, you know, just like the lion in the jungle, in calling out the disease cells. My offering is all disease is self-imposed. We do it to ourselves. Let's imagine that I have a field out here I've got a one-acre field, and I've got a dead rabbit, and I put the rabbit out there on the field. Now, before I put the rabbit out there on the field, I went out and I roped off every square foot separately on this one-acre field, and I measured how many quote unquote decay organisms are, how many bacteria and viruses are on every square foot of this acre. And what I found was that the count was virtually identical square foot by square foot by square foot throughout the whole acre. So I put the rabbit right in the center of the field. And it's 98.6 degrees body temperature and I leave it there for three days and come back. I'm once again going to do a survey of how many bacteria, viruses, reducer organisms there are on every square foot in the field. There's going to be an elevated count somewhere in that field where 100% of the time is the elevated count going to be. It's right there in dead center where the tissues decaying where the need for reducer organisms is increased because of the decay of tissue. The reducer organism is not the cause of the decay. The reducer organism is part of the creation that is designed to clean up the mess so that it doesn't toxify everything else. Now, if you listen to the ancients, they said, take care of the heart or out of it are the issues in life. Now, they weren't talking about the, the physical organ called the heart. That word heart in our modern und- updated language would be the unconscious. They were saying, take care what you deny and dissociate from in yourself. Take care of your own unconscious mind because that's the energy with which you will create results in your life. So I said, take care of the heart, for out of it are the issues in life. You notice they didn't say take care of the other guy, for out of them are the issues in life. Your issues come from your own heart. If you never open the veil of your own temple and look inside of your own unconscious or your own heart, then you're going to wonder why certain things are happening. A particular ancient teacher a master physiologist, a master psychologist, a master geneticist, neurobiologist, and physicist, a man named Yeshua, 2,000 years ago said, you must forgive from your heart the wrongs of your brother. What was he saying? He was saying you need to go inside of your own unconscious and remove what you have projected into your brain's image of your brother, your project construct that has not a picture of you but of your brother, the person you've been telling your mind to blame for what's going on. So he was giving people the keys on how to heal what was going on inside themselves. So our perceptions, our realities, literally are an internal construct 
that often bears little resemblance to the outer world of actuality. And we referred to it other times. The CIA did research on perception, working to improve the intelligence information that came from their analysts. Here's what the CIA put in writing that they found about perception. Perception is demonstrably an active rather than passive process. It constructs rather than records reality. People continuously construct their own version of reality. So when you really integrate and understand this work, you realize that your eyes do not see outside of you. They are not windows on the world. The pictures your eyes seem to show you are an artificially created construct of the, your own mind. This artificially generated world is nothing but a reflection when there is hostility or fear of an unresolved past, which tricks us into thinking that the world we see is actually out there instead of in here. And these constructs, these realities, are our own private perceptual assault on ourselves. Now, those perceptual constructs may match actuality. I mean, it may actually be true out there, but the way that you tell whether or not they're true in here is, are you the one that's feeling the effect of them? Because the perceptual constructs of your mind will always, first and foremost, tell you about the content of your own mind. So this, this word heart that's being used there in Aramaic would be the unconscious. Out of the hidden parts of our own minds flow the energies that control our perceptual constructs, our lives, our ease or pain, our joy or depression, our aliveness or death. Yeshua and Aramaic never said, forgive your brothers. <laughs> Big mistake. Pardon, if you will, but reserve forgiveness for the only place it belongs, and that's inside of you. It's a tool for removing defects in, projection, in perception. Maintaining love, your human life in your mind, is not a religious idea. It is the, the highest fuel designed to keep your mind and love on track. And Ms. Jeannie, I see that we're down to about five minutes, and so I'm just going to check in with you and see if we have anyone with a hand up in the phone queue or anything happening in the chat room. No, it is all quiet, and I'm actually going to have to slip out, and so if somebody has a question right now, it's the time to press one. Otherwise, we won't okay, see your Jeannie's hand go up. Okay, an appointment. Yeah, Jeannie's got an appointment. We've got about five minutes, and uh, I, I mean, I can continue with what I had planned to present, but if you've got a thought, then please hit one, and Jeannie will introduce you. She's going to be leaving for her appointment, and uh, I'll just complete the show. So if you're out there in listener land, our call-in number is 563. If you're on a station where we can't see you in our control panel, it's 563-999-3581. If you call that number, you're listening to the show. If you push one, I'll raise a hand in the control panel. We'll be having a conversation. So, Miss Jeannie? It is all quiet here. All right. Well, then, being all quiet... I'll just say have a, uh, a safe uh, and easy visit with the dentist. All right. And uh, I'll see when you go back, sweetheart. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So we're not going to be able to answer any questions now because our master of the control panel, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jeannie, for everything you do, has left the building. So to continue with the ideas we were talking about, so Yeshua was telling us that what we feel and, and blame somebody else for, through denial, we're hiding from ourselves.
And when we do that, we're really stepping up into uh, self-destruction. It's time to stop hiding from ourselves. If I'm feeling pain, my internal structure is warning me that there's something going on inside of me. When I speak, think, or act as though something inside of me is caused by something outside of me, I'm in denial. And in order to make that false belief logical, I have to hide the part of my mind that's creating the disturbance. That's how we create an unconscious mind. So when I do this, when I enter into denial, I create a hidden compartment in my own mind, and that compartment, again, is called the unconscious. And by definition, once I've set it up, I have no direct access to it. And through repeated denial, I strongly energize that hidden content. I literally intensify it. You know, imagine that I've got a three-foot diameter spring sitting here on the floor. Can that spring do anything? No. But what happens if I push it down and lock it, and I push it down and lock it, and I push it down and lock it, and then I get three or four big guys to come over and give me a hand, and we're going to really crank that spring down and lock it down. What's going to happen when I let go of the lock? Bang, it's going to take off. Everything that I deny and when I repeatedly deny is like locking that energy down inside of me. And and by definition, energy is motion and everything that moves creates an energy wave. So that strongly energized content, if I'm in denial of something, reflects my creative process. Literally, the motion of that energy suppressed in me is intensified, and everything that moves sets up an energy wave. And at some point, somebody's going to tap into that energy wave and, much to my regret, turn around and bring home the bacon. So once again, short of a a punch in the nose, cancel the thought, my denial causes all of the unpleasant sensations sensations that I feel in my own body. It intensifies my pain. And my offering is we do that to ourselves. The objective of this work is to put an end to that habit. And so I am honored and delighted that we get to have this conversation every day or at least five days a week. I hope that you're about to have the best year yet of your eternal life. It's an awesome gift to give the world.